dogs make the best companions for humans, this podcast aims to help make humans better companions for their dogs. Welcome to the Baru Podcast, a modern lifestyle podcast for dogs and their people. I'm your host, Charlotte Bain. I've been caring for other people's dogs for more than 15 years. And while I've learned a lot in my career, I definitely don't know it all. So I've collected an ever-evolving roster of amazing dog people, and I learn new things from them all the time. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Baru Podcast. Today, I chat barking and behavior with certified professional dog trainer Kiki Yablon. In addition to holding a Master of Arts degree in Applied Behavioral Science, Kiki is faculty at the renowned Karen Pryor Dog Training Academy. She's also a friend of my sister. We chat about what barking is, what your dog may be trying to tell you, and some ways we can help minimize this sometimes super undesirable behavior. And just a heads up, Kiki lost her beloved canine companion of 17 and a half years, Pigeon, a few weeks before our conversation. So we do briefly chat about pet loss. And my heart goes out to Kiki. Let's listen. Can I ask you about Pigeon? Mm -hmm. Just want to say that I'm thinking of you and that we don't have to talk about him or her? Her. Her. Okay. You're doing okay. I have not, I have yet to experience that. So my guy's almost 15. So. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I did a lot of pre- grieving too with her like watching her decline especially like since this april uh when she she started to really i think we started to think about it in april because she got an ulcer in her eye and, Mm. uh, and we had to make a decision about what to do about it like we tried treating it medically but it wasn't really responding well and so the option was to take out her eye or, oh wow, yeah, you know, call it. And it's a fairly minor surgery, so we decided that she had been enjoying some things about her life recently enough that we would try it. And she did, mm-hmm. she did bounce back a little bit, but um, but then in the last month or so, she started to decline again. And, and my husband, I was out of town and my husband said that he saw similar things happening in her eye that had been the tip oh. off, like had been the first signs that, of what went wrong with the other eye. Um, and so he took her to the eye doctor again and they confirmed that that's what it was. And that was just like yeah. the idea of taking out her second eye at, she was right. 17 and a half. Oh my gosh. She was, you know, she was suffering from some other things too. So yeah, it was, yeah. it was hard. I, 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 it's my first time too, actually. I mean, with a dog, I, I have a cat. I had a cat that passed away when I was an adult, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah, I don't know if it's just me or if it's normal, or, but I feel like grief and guilt are always tied up. Yeah. Together. No. Like you didn't do enough things right while the yeah. they were still around. So Yeah. I think that I think you're right. Because in my experience with loss, yeah, you go through all the things you should have been you should have done or you should have shown up in a different way and all the things. So but it is what it is. And my heart goes out to you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. So this is my little my little, my little stuffed pigeon over here. Where'd you Where'd you get that? Does it look yeah. like her? What can it I looks see? More her? like a It looks more like a chihuahua. Looks like a I deer think. to me. <laughs> well, she did look like a deer. She did. Yeah, but um, it doesn't quite look like her. But I know it's supposed to. Did you get her? Did someone give that to you as a gift, or did you just you found it? I I got it like a long time ago when she okay. was like three three or something. But during uh-huh. the during the pandemic, this was my um, desktop demo dog. It was like and my husband actually made me a leash for her so I could talk about leash skills. 
Oh, like great. I can, I can demonstrate leash skills. Like, like here's how you shorten your leash, you know, um, Perfect. Without, without having to get up and move around. Right. So teeny tiny leash. Right. Yeah. Cute. Um, well, do you want to jump in or I don't know. It does. I don't know. Sure. If it feel, does it feel right? I don't know. It's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. okay. It's okay. Well, I'll get it together then. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. Well, first of all, thank you for taking the time out to do this with me. Um, Well, I want to know, I know you, I want to first, before we jump into barking, which is one of the main reasons that I wanted to chat with you, um, because I think it's probably one of the most common things that my clients complain about or ask me for referrals for trainers um, is to get a handle on their dogs barking, whether it's like become too overwhelming or they don't understand it, or they just want it to stop pretty much. Um, But I'd love to just talk a little bit about you and your journey into becoming a dog trainer. Cause I know you were, you, as you were mentioning, you were in a band and then I know that you were a journalist or you may still be doing that as well. Um, Nope, not at all. Just, (laughs) yeah. What? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you left that left that behind. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. What was your journey? Because it's kind of a little bit different for everyone. I feel everyone that I've talked to, I feel like so far. So yeah, I think that? there's. I think there are usually some common origin story. Yeah. Uh, themes <laughs> like you adopted a dog who really needed to live with a trainer, and so you became one. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I uh, well. I grew up in Ohio and we had a, an Irish setter until I was five, I think, um, who I was obsessed with. And my parents gave him away when, uh, my mom was pregnant with my little brother. Um, and I was sort of devastated and asked for a dog for every holiday, anything that had a, (laughs) had a gift potential. I right. would ask for a dog and then I would never get one. And so I started like not asking for anything else in hopes mm-hmm. that that would somehow force my parents to get me a dog, but it, it never happened. So, um, and then I became an adult. Um, when I started living on my own, I adopted a cat because I thought that I didn't really have time for a dog. And, um, and then I was like 35 when I adopted, uh, when my husband and I adopted Pigeon. So I was very excited. <laughs> um, picked her up at the shelter and I cried all the way home. And then, no. um, I know. <laughs> uh, and as it happens, and I really wanted to do training, like I wanted to train her so that she could like hang out with me, but I didn't know anything really. I didn't know how to pick out a dog and yeah. I didn't know, um, uh, how to train a dog. I bought, I did buy a book before I started, which I think, you know, puts me one step ahead of most people, but. Oh yeah. I just stumbled upon my guy. It wasn't wasn't really the right book. So, (laughs) um, (laughs) happily my next door neighbor at the time was a woman named Jessica Whiten, who was a trainer at the shed aquarium. She is now, she now lives in Iceland where she's the beluga curator for sea life trust that's so um, cool and she gave me a really quick sort of clicker training demo and handed me a like a box clicker that said sunshine books on the back and I spent a while trying to google sunshine books and figure out what it was and where this clicker thing came from and uh, I eventually signed up for some classes with a clicker trainer named Laura Monaco Torelli Mm -hmm. Uh, who was also another shed aquarium a former shed aquarium trainer um we took a couple of classes pigeon was like the little star of the class um but at the same time she was also going to daycare and not having a great time there we think Mm -hmm. um and and laura actually finally told us even though she probably wasn't supposed to that Mm -hmm. Um, cause she didn't think pigeon was having a good time there. So, um, and around that time she started to kind of hide behind us at the dog park and, mm. um, just started to have some issues with strangers and other dogs. And, you know, in retrospect, I think she was 
when she came to us at seven months old, she was sort of fearful and we didn't recognize that. Yeah. Kept putting her in situations where she learned that the best way to get things to stop was to lash out. So yeah. Yell at them. Um, yeah. So, so then I embarked on kind of a wandering through the wilderness of dog training. Um, I did not understand how you could use positive reinforcement to reduce behavior that you didn't want to mm-hmm. see. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tried a couple of other types of training and thought about doing some other things that I never really had the heart to do. And right. it probably made things worse, um, mm-hmm. before I sort of came back around to Laura and asked her what I could do. And then I started reading and reading and reading and yeah. um and I think at, at about at some point I was like I haven't read a book outside of work that wasn't about this in like <laughs> three years and so I started thinking about and also journalism was like getting unpleasant this is around probably 2007 yeah. it's a tough and, gig yeah the reader was sold I'm sure you heard all about that from your sister who I worked yeah, with was that all yeah. the way that long ago 2000 yeah. wow wow yeah mm-hmm. I remember that whole thing um, yeah very unpleasant situation and I started to think about what else is this something that I would like to pursue right mm-hmm. so um so I did you know I I volunteered at a shelter or two um I took about a year but I got Laura Torelli to take me as an intern, um, nice. which I'm eternally grateful for. And um, and then I, after I had been working with her for a little while as a as an a, like a, an apprentice or an intern, I went through Karen Pryor Academy. Um, right. So, for like um, the average listener who doesn't know who Karen Pryor is, do you want to give a brief? Because you you now are a, you're an educator at Karen Pryor, correct? Yes. Yeah. I'm a faculty member for the Karen Pryor Academy for Animal Behavior and Training, which is a, a dog training school mm-hmm. um, and also offers classes for, it offers like the flagship course is a professional certification course, but there are also various levels of courses you can take if you are a, just a pet owner or someone who's interested but doesn't necessarily want to do it professionally. Right. So, oh, that's um, good. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. You can actually take, basically, you can take the certification course without the certification. It's called it. the Dog Trainer Comprehensive, I think. Um, you can also, there's also like a 12-week online course that's like foundations of clicker training. And then there are a number of interesting courses like Michelle I, I would never know how to pronounce her name Puglio Pugliot teaching freestyle is it P-U-G-L-I P-O-U-I oh, yeah, totally off. <laughs> yeah. yeah um I have to have it in front of me to spell it but um and also Ken Ramirez uh for instance is teaching he teaches classes on building non-food reinforcers and also has one really that I hope to take if he offers it again in the future when I have a dog, a snake avoidance, positive reinforcement, snake avoidance class. I was just talking to somebody about that because I don't know of any positive reinforcement snake avoidance courses here. And my clients always ask about that. And so they end up doing the other because there's a lot of snakes. People hike a lot here. So yeah. Yeah. Interesting. um, I mean, Ken's brilliant, but uh, he did a, he did like a short, presentation on it like 90 minute presentation on his snake avoidance training at Mm -hmm. clicker expo live last year the online version yeah and I was a moderator for it and it was really impressive but it's basically just teaching the prerequisite skills really well understanding how to make things about snakes the cue for a very Mm -hmm. really strong recall and in his case it was um have the you know the dog wasn't just a recall that was he has his dog go to a crate that's like in case nobody's home basically to go recall to they go to a crate and they hit a buoy that like closes the door that's amazing so put themselves in a crate 
And the, yeah. the final video he showed <laughs> for this thing was <laughs> insane. It was, the, the, it was on the ranch where I'm going next week. And he, um, the dog ran basically across 13 acres. Oh my like gosh. From the, from the back of the property all the way to the barn, put himself in the crate. That's so, so cool. And they had sort of cameras set up all through the woods to catch, right. you know, different pieces of his run back to the house. So. so he just sees the, when he spots the snake or hears the snake, that triggers him. That's a cue to run back to the crate? Yeah, there's a few. They use different, I, I, I can't speak to the exact yeah. specifics. I don't remember, but it's like all, a bunch of different sensory, you know, there's like the smell of snake and snake poop. Like there was mm, one whole yeah. segment about how he made a flurry of snake poop, you know, to use. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't see your average pet owner doing that, but you never yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, snake, snake skins, like yeah. rubber, rubber snakes, so sight, smell. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, it's cool. Um, Anyway, so yeah, Karen, Karen Pryor is no longer working in the organization. She's retired, um, but she was a pioneer in using uh, the science of learning or behavior analysis to train animals. So she started in the 60s at oh, wow. sea, Life, sea Life Park in Hawaii. Her okay. husband was running the place, and there was supposed to be a dolphin show. And if I remember the story right, the the trainer they had hired quit not too long before was supposed to open and she okay. had trained like their dog and a horse or something. <laughs> so <laughs> she so she she picked up the manual, um, which had been written by a graduate student of BS Skinner and started to figure it out. Okay. And um and so she she helped uh, really popularize clicker training. Right. Um and, and wrote uh the seminal book um I don't think seminal is the right word anymore. <laughs> Influential book, um, Don't Shoot the Dog. Yep. Was supposed to just be about positive reinforcement and why people should use it in general. I believe she, I've seen her say that she hoped to change, you know, the education system. But her editor picked up on the phrase, a phrase about, you know, the options that you have if you don't like what the dog is doing and there was sort of a joke like you could shoot the dog you know right <laughs> back in the, no, and, no, not when that yeah. wasn't funny <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh and made that the title of the book uh, much to her chagrin because right. she thought right. oh now only like people will think it's a dog training book which right is sort of what happened but um but she did revolutionize animal training so um so that's who karen Pryor is great um yeah, so I went through that program, that training program, and then I started to both work for Laura uh, as an like an at first like an assistant trainer, and then mm -hmm. I became her training manager, and then I also she was kind enough to let me sort of have my own business on the side too. Nice. So, um, and when I when I decided to make the switch I quit my job at the reader which at the time was the editor-in-chief um I quit halfway through the Karen Pryor Academy you quit the reader halfway um, through the Karen Pryor oh that's awesome yeah <laughs> like I got to about the second unit and I thought I think I'm gonna do okay yeah <laughs> not fail <laughs> and then um and then I decided to quit right. so um and then I took a job at a pet store <laughs> You did just so, doing like retail. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. And training dogs on the side or. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then when I got to a point where I, my two days off were filled up, then I quit the retail gig. Yeah. So did it for about a year and a half. And that's it. Um, um, so yeah, then, then I, um, probably the next thing I did that turned that was really influential in my career was to um, take this course called Living and Learning with Animals with okay. Susan Friedman. Okay. Which is Remind me who, who she is. I know she's a big deal. She is, um, she's a behavior analyst. So someone with a, a, a PhD level degree mm -hmm. in field, you know, in learning. 
and she worked with humans um, under some of the big names in that field for the first half of her career. And then she began to disseminate this information to animal trainers, I think, starting with parrots. Mm, okay. um, I think she was basically reading, you know, and she got a parrot and was reading advice on how to train your parrot mm-hmm. and was like, what is, <laughs> why don't, why don't these people know anything about how behavior works? Right. <laughs> um, so she started to teach people who wanted to learn and it kind of grew from there. Cool. So, um, so her course really got me interested in a, like Karen Pryor Academy gives you sort of an introduction to that, that science, but her course is like a deeper introduction. Right. It's all about that for eight weeks. And that really blew my mind. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, secrets of the universe. Right. You know? um, <laughs> it all made sense after that. Yeah. Yeah. And I really, it felt like it really leveled up my training because I'm sure because you understand now that there are these underlying principles that are always in operation and Mm -hmm. you can kind of, you're not just floating in space. You can kind of touch the sides if you need to, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So, so I ended up uh, after a couple of years, I stayed in touch with her and I ended up becoming a teaching assistant for her. Oh, wow. Um, And anyway, I ended up going back to, to get a graduate degree in uh, applied behavior analysis. Didn't you did you that where you the, just gra- that you just graduated, right? Isn't that what you I just, just yeah, I just finished. Yeah. Congratulations. So, That's amazing. Wow. Age 52. Good job. <laughs> so, unfortunately, you know, for better or for worse, you don't need a degree uh, or any kind of formal education to call yourself a dog trainer right um, or, or a, behavior, podcast or a episode. yeah mm-hmm. yeah for that matter yeah um so I mean it was kind of nice like as an adult like I was like I, I'm gonna go back to school and get some information that I want yeah <laughs> which is yeah. not really like how I went to college the first time so yeah and then you come out of it you come out of a master's degree in that field just basically knowing how little you new no yeah. <laughs> so yeah I, we're still no yeah. you know yeah. there's still so much to still so much more to learn oh so. I'm sure I'm sure so I wanted to jump into barking because um I thought we could go over some a little basic information about barking like kind of clarify what it is and w- why it's kind of important to your dog and um, kind of clear up a little bit of the misinformation around it before we jump into some of the ways that we can help curb you suggest to help curb your dog's barking and maybe get a better understanding of your dog does that make sense yeah yeah okay. yeah um so i think honestly the most important thing to recognize about barking is that barking is behavior right. and so it operates um the same way as any other behavior um which is that if it, uh, I mean, with dogs, it's a behavior that comes with the package, sort of like, you know, in, in, in typical humans, talking right. comes with the package. It's just one of the behaviors that we do. But then once we start doing it, we get feedback from the environment, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so we talk, we say something, and there's an effect on our environment. Yeah. Uh, and if we like that effect or if that, that effect is satisfactory to us, it could be that we get something we want. It could be that we stop something that we don't want, uh, or avoid something that we don't want. And then that is going to affect how likely we are to do it again next time we are in a similar situation. Right. So that little unit of the situation that happening Mm -hmm. you know around the behavior and the outcome of the behavior and the behavior that's the smallest unit that is useful to look at okay so just asking about how do I stop barking right our first question should be what what are we talking about what does the barking look like Mm -hmm. what what behavior are we talking about and then it should be 
when does it happen and what does what seems to happen in the environment when the dog barks what what changes to the dog's environment does it produce right. um so barking so asking why does a dog bark is sort of like asking why does a person talk right how do i stop this how do i stop this person from talking right, right? i think if you think about it that way a lot of the questions you might want to ask suddenly become really clear right. <laughs> Well, what are they talking about? Why, why are they saying that? You know, what are they getting out of saying that? It's a great you know, way to look at it. Yeah. Why might they be saying um, So where it gets, I think, really interesting is then you have to think about talking and talking is just behavior too. Right. right. Oh. <laughs> and talking is, talking is behavior that is separate from the behavior that like the feelings or whatever that you might be representing with your talking. Right. Right. So we often think like, oh, you know, that person is angry or that dog is angry or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they're talking in a certain way or growling in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or we might say, oh, that person seems totally happy. Because I asked them how they were and they said they were fine. Right. Right. But the behavior of saying I'm fine, thanks, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, could have its own function of, you know, it could be a behavior that you're doing to get someone to stop asking you questions. Right. You know, or it could be uh, trying to convey your inner state of fineness to your doctor, you know, (laughs) you know, honestly or whatever. So uh, same behavior can have, can look different. In different situations. Um, Behavior that has the same purpose. Right. um, Can look very different from each those behaviors can look very different from each other. Um, so, so commonly, and I do this too, like we look at a dog who's barking in a low tone with um, stiff body mm-hmm. and ears pinned back mm-hmm. or, you know, tail up or whatever. And we say, we assume that the function of that barking is to make something go away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think the jury's out on whether dogs are as complicated as humans in terms of like what they, how many functions that their barking can acquire, like the same, you know, uh, like how, like how faithfully we can interpret their body language or how accurately we can interpret their body language. You know, it may be that because they don't have language, which is creates this complex network of associations and, and functions and stuff like that they that you know it's fairly safe to assume a dog is barking at something because based on what it looks like right. you know what we can assume why they're barking but it's not certainly not always true and some examples so I gave a webinar on barking for a German dog training club oh, earlier this week yep and I had two video examples one was um my friend Kira Moore's dog Frida who's on Instagram as Frida Paulo does tricks <laughs> um and I just showed Frida growling and with her tail moving rapidly mm-hmm. right and I said what do we think the function of this behavior is why is this dog growling oh you know it's afraid and then I showed the whole clip which was her going inside boy and the dog going yeah. and then it clicked her <laughs> uh-huh. right so dogs can learn to act right right <laughs> um right right and then the other clip i showed was um i was dog sitting for the last month in um up in maine mm-hmm. um and one of the dogs i i took some video of one of the dogs and he was i was sitting on the couch working on my computer and he was barking out the window mm-hmm. and you know the assumption looking at that is you know he's barking at something out you know something out there he wants it to go away or he's alerting you or whatever there's nothing out there Hmm. i am 99 percent sure um and he did this frequently um when i sat down with the computer you know and i wasn't actually there I wasn't really there as a trainer. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's hard to turn it right, off. But right. like, 
that I was supposed to just be dog sitting. And so I hadn't like taken a history on this behavior or anything. And the owner was out of town. So I didn't have a chance to ask her about it, but it, it sort of came out in conversation that, uh, you know, often when he does that while she's working, like she gets up and gets him a toy or he really likes to be chased around okay. the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know what the, I didn't do a real assessment of it, but it's, <laughs> it's possible. Those were, that's what he was looking for by barking out the and window. That's so fascinating. That was, yeah, that he was like facing the window and barking out yeah. into the world. Like she's not doing this. <laughs> Yeah. So, but, um, uh, my friend, uh, do you know who Emily Johnson Bay is? I don't think I do. She's, a, uh-huh. she's, she's one half of the training, the Swedish training team called Carpe Momentum. Should she be on the podcast? Um, okay. Oh yeah. She's amazing. She, she tells a great story about how these kind of things happen. She, she has a great illustration. So basically once we behave, Mm -hmm. right. One of the, one of the coolest things about our behavior is that we can learn to use it for things that we didn't originally use it for. Right. Right. So I learned to pick, I learned to pick up a a toy. Mm -hmm. And then I also learned that I can pick up food. I can pick up a a child, I can pick money, like, yeah. you know, like, mm-hmm. like I can continue like something new on the ground that I've never seen before. Right. I can pick it up. Right. Like I can take my behavior for one thing and use it for something else. And that's sort of a blessing and a curse. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it's really easy for behaviors to acquire new purposes and right. it's a cool part of life that they do. Um, and one example I always give is what dog would sit still to get food Mm -hmm. right that's not why dogs sit originally to get people to give them food that would be that would be dumb there's food there let's go get it but but we very quickly teach them that sitting almost always gets food right you know isn't Um, isn't sitting not like a normal behavior in dogs I don't that I don't know you might have to ask an ethologist that question I I mean I think by the time I see yeah. dogs, or even honestly, even little yeah. puppies, They're um, sitting. like one time I got a chance to um, help raise some. I had a client who called me and said, "Can you come help train this dog I found by the side of the road?" And then two days later, I was like, uh, "She's pregnant," Aww. and so I got a <laughs> chance to like help help with you know, uh-huh. raise. She had thirteen puppies, and I got a chance to kind of get in early with them, and you know you bring in food and if one of them put their butt down, I would give them. Yeah. So I think it probably it, is, a it is a natural behavior. I read something that, and I could have this totally wrong, but there was a study of like street dogs. Um, most often they just are, la- they're laying down or they're um, standing up. So. That makes yeah. sense. That would be, that would be what I would do if I had my yeah. choice. I would never sit. <laughs> yeah. Politely, politely and stare at you. So uncomfortable. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. That's so true. Yeah. I, I hate sitting. Like, I like I like to be standing or lying down, but other people like yeah, so. anyway. Um I think I think it's an I think it's something that they're cap they they come with the capability to do, most yeah. of them. Um even greyhounds I've seen sit, you know, dogs that they say don't sit, yeah. but um but they may, maybe they do it more around humans because humans are up here. Oh, that's an interesting take. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And if you want to, if you want to rest, if you want to rest, but also look at the right. human, then you, you know, it's like the drinky bird. Yeah. Toy. Oh, that would, like, never would have occurred butt to goes me. down, your head yep. goes up. Mm-hmm. I don't, I have no, I have no yeah, idea. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so Emily's story is. If you go to your mom and you ask for a glass of milk and I could be screwing this up, but <laughs> you go to your mom and and ask for a glass of milk and she gives you a soccer ball. Mm-hmm. Like the first time you might be like, what, why? Yeah. <laughs> but then maybe you take your soccer ball out and you play with it and you find that it's fun. And then if you do it again and you get a soccer ball again, now you have a new way to ask for a soccer ball. And somebody looking at that from the outside is going to be like, that's really weird. Right. Um, but it makes total sense if you understand how behavior works, right? That was a successful behavior to get a soccer right. ball even though that wasn't its original purpose. Right. She asked for milk. She got so, so now she just asks for milk for a soccer ball all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So dog barks out the window to get your attention. Yeah. Seems weird, right. but 
totally see how that might get shaped up. Um, yeah. So some, so barking is, so barking is a behavior that I think gets, ends up acquiring a lot of functions Mm -hmm. because it's a really normal dog behavior to do. Um, I would say that dogs often use it when quieter or other ways of getting things from humans are not, is not working. It's probably really effective because it's annoying to the human, to a lot of humans, and they'll they'll do anything to get it to stop. Um, Yes. So I think um, it often comes out in circumstances that we might call the frustration, Mm -hmm. which basically looks like, you know, there's a reinforcer there that you want and you don't, none of your behavior is working to get it. Right. And I think, I don't know for sure, but it seems to me from experience that that is a situation where you get a barking right. a lot of the time. Would the same be true? So would the same be true if you have like dogs that have like excessive barking when, you know, the dogs that just, I have a few clients who just really don't turn it off very often. Um, one of them is super sound sensitive. And, and so we think he's just, um, he's wired a little differently. So there might be some other things going on there. Um, he's hypersensitive to everything, but, um, yeah. the other one is just, she just, she barks constantly. And I mean, I can look at her and say, you know, she's, uh, I don't know how that was reinforced. She was a rescue. Um, and, but it's just barking at every, you turn on the water, she bark, you bark, you walk. And they've had her like five years now. And so it's still, it's, you open the door, she barks, you read a newspaper, she barks, you know, and she's a very vocal dog in general. She growls when she's just, when she's talking, she'll be like, you know, she's just always talking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, would that be the same? Um, well, it's hard. I can't really say without knowing yeah. the context, but the, the first thing you would do is sort of look at the situations where the dog barks mm-hmm. and say, you know, what, what helps me predict it? What, what do I know? What is sort of the cue from the environment or from me to that, that seems to evoke the barking. Mm-hmm. And then what, what happens when the dog barks that, would seem to make it worth doing that again next time. Um, sometimes that can be really tricky to ferret out yeah. because because things that maintain outcomes that make behavior worth doing don't necessarily happen every single time the behavior happens. Got so it. a lot of yeah. like bark, when the dog barks, a lot of different things might happen. Like dog barks and sometimes person yells at them. Sometimes the person, you know, grabs them by the scruff. Sometimes the person uh, goes and gets them something to do. Sometimes, you know, the person uh, talks to them and says, it's okay. It's okay. And so it can, it could take in some of the more difficult cases, it can take some real figuring and some testing to try to figure out what, um, what the purpose of the dog's barking actually is. It's not everything that it produces. It's some of the things that it produces. Right. Um, and that type of reinforcement mm-hmm. where it's not every time, mm-hmm. one of the features of that, of doing that, is that you can make behavior very persistent. So the the classic metaphor for this is the slot machine Mm -hmm. Um, like why do people keep pulling the lever on the slot machine when they when they only win sometimes um and that's sort of the classic example of intermittent reinforcement making behavior persistent got it when when in the face of not getting reinforced very often um that said, I think also I, I kind of have problems with that metaphor because there's I think there's a reason that slot machines have lights and bells and pictures and stuff. <laughs> and there's probably like I think it's probably also sort of fun to pull the right. well, could, lever and see all those things. Could it be fun to bark? There's, there's little little, little reinforcers. Yeah. Um well when I say fun, I'm still talking about what outcome it produces. Like when you pull the lever, and I think that's often the case with when we say somebody does something for fun, mm-hmm. like I was just talking to a student about this. Um, and we were, she was saying that uh, one of the dolphins that she works with um, hits a tether ball for fun. And so we had a good time saying, okay, what does for fun look like? Like what happened? What, what, what does the tether ball do when she hits yeah. it? 
swings around, you know, <laughs> that can be a reinforcer. Right. Like I, I had a, my dog that I took, the dog that I took through Karen Pryor Academy, which wasn't Pigeon, it was this other dog named Guffman. Mm-hmm. I had a behavior where he went and, you know, pressed the staples easy button. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And then mm-hmm. I would say that was easy. <laughs> and I had to, I had to take it out of our final performance for the, the final exam because the behaviors had to be under control of your cue. Uh-huh. And I could not get that under control of my cue because if he hit it and it made the sound, he was like, delighted yeah. <laughs> like I didn't have to give him a treat you know right so just just like doing something and seeing it have an effect yeah. sometimes is reinforcing but we are looking for the effect and not for something inside the dog called enjoyment or fun well, yeah I was gonna say like I wonder if yeah. there's some sort of like endorphin rush or something when a dog barks or something like that yeah I mean why do why do people scream into a pillow yeah, or totally. yeah whatever yeah. Um, yes, but I don't, but it's hard to say because those effects are not, we can't observe those or measure those. So from a standard dog trainer perspective, like there are people who are doing research where they measure, you know, hormone releases and things like that. But, um, even those they interpret by what behaviors they're correlated with. So you got a spike in cortisol. They're usually also looking at, you know, is the dog pacing as well. So, um, yeah. So if you're going to try to change barking to something else mm-hmm. that you like mm-hmm. better, it can be really helpful to try to make at least an educated guess at what the dog is barking to get, because that gives you some tools. Like you can try to give the dog the thing they're barking for proactively so they don't need to bark. That's usually, that's often an yeah. easy one. Um, you can uh, try to, you can teach the dog to do something other than bark to get the same thing. Okay. Right. If you can do, if you can do something easier than barking, if you can come over and give me a chin rest and I get up and get you a toy, ah. then you don't have to stand there and bark right. at me. <laughs> so, um, so, th- so learning the function of the behavior can help you decide on an effective way to reduce it because you're meeting the need that it is expressing basically there are um going back to the intermittent reinforcement thing uh i think certain certain good certain well-intentioned approaches like so someone has the idea okay i get it if i don't want the dog to bark at me then I should reward something else, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that that gets applied in some incomplete ways because people don't have all the information about how these things work. So let's say the dog comes over and barks at you and you ask him to sit and then you give him what he was, was barking to get you're probably going to increase barking because because he had to bark at you to get the opportunity to do the behavior that would get the reward. So better would be, so in addition to figuring out what is the function of the behavior and trying to provide that for something else, we also want to pay attention to what's the cue, what's cueing the behavior, right? Is it that the dog has been alone for four hours? And you just got home from work. Is it that you're on the computer? (laughs) You know, is it uh, when it when it's barking directed at you, especially? um, And you want to notice those things, and you want to ask the dog to do the alternative behavior before they start Mm -hmm. barking, and then reward it. Okay. So they're learning in this situation. Do this, you get your thing. We can skip the bark. Got it. Um, So that's one way I think problems get shaped up is people wait until the dog is barking and then ask for and redirect them to something yeah. else. So anticipating the trigger, what, 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 what triggers your dog to bark is the key, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Part of, part of the key. Sometimes we're yeah. busy doing something else. And so we don't know, we don't catch it in time, like most behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you're already in, if you're already in the SHIT, like then go yeah. ahead and redirect your dog. Yeah. I think that's the best <laughs> thing you can do in that moment. Yeah. There's not a perfect thing to do then. Yeah. Um, 
another option, so another place I think people go wrong with barking is they have been told to ignore it mm-hmm. if it yeah. is. And that has a couple of pitfalls. One is if you ignore barking and the purpose of that barking is not something that you're they're getting from you, mm-hmm. ignoring doesn't do anything, mm-hmm. nothing, irrelevant. If they're barking at you to get something, if they're barking to get something that you usually deliver Mm -hmm. and they already have developed this habit and then you start trying to ignore it because someone said, oh, just ignore behavior you don't like Mm -hmm. and it will go away. What generally happens there is there's a phenomenon that you, I'm sure you know about already, but it's called an extinction burst where behavior that has worked before is now suddenly not working. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't just stop doing it and never do it again. Right. You, what tends to happen is you do it a bunch of times, maybe more intensely. Yep. Maybe, maybe you try some other behaviors Mm -hmm. that you think might work. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe you stop, but then next time you're probably going to try again. And it it just can be a very slow way Mm -hmm. to get rid of a behavior. And it's very frustrating for the learner to just suddenly have your behavior that worked before not working. Sure. Um, And then if you're trying to ignore it and you can't ignore it because you're like on the phone Mm -hmm. or you're on Zoom or you have dinner guests or whatever, (laughs) and and you're like, oh, okay, you know, just be quiet. I'm getting your toy or whatever. Yeah. Um. Then what you've done is you've reinforced a very big version, long duration, intense version of the barking. Because you let it go till the point where it was you, bonkers. You, tr- you tried to ignore yeah. it and you failed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think that's another way that some of these more tr- difficult cases get built up. Yeah. Is that makes sense. Inter- intermittent reinforcement. Right. And dogs will learn. Oh, this works when you're on Zoom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. This always works when you're on Zoom. Right. Or this always works when there's guests over. Right. You know, and it's not malicious on their part. That's just how learning works. Yeah. Like we do our behavior, we learn that it works. And we also are going to, we're also built to learn under what circumstances does it work. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so those are, those are, Those are tricky situations. So I I think a lot of the, I think, I don't know, the two, two biggest complaints I hear about are things like barking at other dogs, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. uh, or strangers, like in a way that seems like go away Mm -hmm. um, or frustration at not being able to get to them. And then the other one, the other big one, I think that people have trouble living with is like owner directed, like barking to get the own stuff from the owner. Right. So. I have a friend who, her brother who has special needs comes to visit on the weekends to where she's living mm-hmm. and her dog goes bonkers at him. Um, and she, um, what, cause she will hear him pull up like on a Friday and she starts barking and she'll see him, you know, walk in and he doesn't know he can't, um, you know, ignore her or do the appropriate things because he, he has special needs. And so he doesn't quite understand what it is that he, he's supposed to be doing. So she doesn't know what to do with her dog in a situation like that. Is that. Yeah. That's a tough situation. Um, something that, I mean, I can't say what she should do, but, um, but, but it may be a case where the best thing to do is something that just prevents the dog from seeing the that's what I was thinking you know brother yeah like yeah you you can change behavior if you can change the the relevant environmental conditions you can almost always change behavior okay can you change it enough Mm -hmm. is is a a question that sort of depends on a lot of things like the, do the people involved have the skills involved? Right. You know, it's, you can, if you can't control the environment, you're going to have some trouble with the behavior, but you, you know, options and situations like that are, you know, can the dog go in an 
another part of the house right. or can the dog go to daycare that day or can the dog, you know, just like not everything has to be trained. Right. Just manage, um, like a manage, manage the situation yeah. so she doesn't have to interact in some form or another. Yeah. But, you know, it's hard to comment specifically yeah. because I don't know what the special needs are or what that yeah. person's, uh, you know, knows or doesn't know or what skills they have. Yeah. And I don't know the, you know, I don't know anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I'm all for easy solutions too. Right. Like I always, uh, I don't think he'll mind me saying this, but yeah. one of my early clients had this, this amazing dog who, uh, it was just like this little, little short legged guy. He looked like a corgi with a German shepherd head. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and he had one ball left cause they, they missed one. <laughs> when really? They neutered him. Really? Does that yeah. happen a lot? At the shelter. Oh, God. I don't know. Bobby. Uh, he was, I loved him and I, he was like one of my very first clients mm-hmm. and he was, I was told that he was kicked out of school you know, for being a, I think the way the owner put it was, a, he was a de- deleterious influence on the other dog. <laughs> anyway, but one of the issues was he would run out the front door and go running around the neighborhood. Okay. And when I got to the house, it was like, there are literally like three doors that the dog had, would have to get through to get outside. Get outside. <laughs> and I was like, we can we can work on like waiting holding back when the door is open but then i can save you like 500 bucks here and just tell you close put put up a sign that says close this door before you open that door like right well, there's nothing right. nothing wrong with that right there, so there's right like if you only have to be on zoom for half an hour and it works to just right. give your dog a bully stick before you sit down. Right. The knowledge that you should do it before you sit down and not after he starts barking is critical. But like if that works for yeah. you and your dog can tolerate bully sticks and he's not going to overeat or throw up or have diarrhea or whatever, like give him a damn bully stick, you know, just do it before you sit down before he starts barking. But like, you know, so I'm all, I'm all in favor of easy solutions yeah. like that. Um but, you know, if you have to be on Zoom for hours a day, you can't have your dog eat their way through 20 bully sticks. Yeah. You know, then you might have to do some training. Yeah. So. And what about when what you said the other most common thing was when dogs are barking, like on doing on leash reactivity or yelling at other dogs and people when they're. On yeah. Walks. I mean, I live in I live in Chicago. Yeah. So I think. I think I think this is a huge problem anywhere the dogs are on leash mostly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you and you would know probably better than me sure. what the effect of that is. Sure. Yeah. And I find there's I think there's a lot less barking when when dogs are off leash and can just do what they want, which kind of feeds into my you know half-assed <laughs> hypothesis that a lot of bar- barking dogs do is, is you know what we uh, situations that we would label frustrated yeah so yeah um but barking and lunging on leash is a, a huge you know i probably get an inquiry every day about that i think there are some general tips that you can give to dog owners which are to sort of be a defensive driver like if your dog barks and lunges at other dogs, and this goes back to like, yeah, let's identify the situation where it happens. Um, if your dog barks and lunges from mm-hmm. 50 feet, then when you see a dog coming down the street, you know, it's time to cross now. Like don't wait until, don't wait until the, your dog is what I yeah. always say, like stuck, the dog's stuck right in there. a tractor yeah. beam of the Death Star. Like, like you're going in now you know yeah <laughs> not a lot you can do in that situation you're going to yeah. end up like hauling your yeah. dog out of there on the leash and it's not pretty right yeah yeah, yeah. so or go behind a and, car you know for years this is all yeah. this is all my husband did with our dog like he didn't he didn't want to do the training so he was sworn to just avoid you know and that was that worked fine for him although i have to say mm-hmm. when when the pandemic hit and we started going for walks together, like all of a sudden my like, you know, 14 year old dog was like, Oh, I get it. 
But like, but you know, I, by the time I got home, I would be like, oh, "You walk." You're like, no more dogs. Exactly. Yeah. I totally yeah. get that. Like, yeah. <laughs> you figure this out. Yeah. Can we briefly talk about um, bark collars? And I know that I've had clients, you know, just be still frustrated, and they just they usually try a bark collar at some point, you know. So, you, can you touch on the bark collar a little bit? And why it's not really an effective tool? Um. Well, it can be effective if your only interest is in does it stop barking. It. it certainly can be, um, but it, I would say the same thing about the bark collar that say about any other using punishment as the first, you know, as the primary tool against suppress any other behavior. So one is um, it doesn't teach the dog what to do instead. So it doesn't address that function of the behavior right. and using aversive stimuli can uh, has some well documented side effects. The big ones are that um, I mean, what you're trying to teach with a bark collar is you're trying to teach the dog to avoid getting the shock or the spray. Um, but you, but you right. can, so you are trying to teach an avoidance, some avoidance behavior. But that behavior is not specified, so that's hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, when you use something like that, you can create other avoidance behaviors that you didn't mean to. Okay. So, you know, the, the dog may learn that it's bark produced the shock, but it may also um, learn that uh, the shock happened in a certain environment. So for instance, right. this is not quite the same thing as a bark collar, but with an invisible fence collar, I've seen a few dogs mm-hmm. that were afraid of other things like the microwave beeping or, you know, other things that made a tone, mm. um, or, you know, mm-hmm. I know trainers have reported, you know, having dogs that don't want to go outside anymore because they can't figure out where that shock is coming from. Um, one of my dogs, they, they're, she goes hiking. And when she was younger, they used to use shock collars, the, the woman who takes them hiking. Um, and I, Actually, a bloom was over working on a, a like a toy that they had put together that they were you know mm-hmm. testing. And it's like a really fun toy, but the toy makes a sound. We didn't realize until we saw the dog bolt. Like as soon as we turned the toy on, she bolt. It makes a really subtle like buzz, yeah. and she just like bolted to the Aww. other like other side of the yard to the acre, and she just sat there and stared. And I was like, okay, she's been really conditioned to yeah. that sound. Yeah. To that yeah, feeling, try so. to turn. She, so she, they, they behave to turn off the, the shock, right? So the be, the behavior is to, you know, close your mouth or stop making the barking sound or whatever, right? Or run that away from it. Turns yeah. the, the aversive thing off. Um, but yeah, you can. So you can get, um, you can get unintended escape avoidance behaviors. You can get um, where they overgeneralize to other things that are similar stimuli, like what you were just talking about um, mm-hmm. with, with like a lifestyle of like getting shocked or, or aversive stimulation for lots of behaviors. You can get um, animals that don't just don't behave very much, which is sad. So they shut down yeah. kind of. Um, so apathy, yeah. uh, like my behavior doesn't, none of my behaviors work. So just, I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, it's a sad state. Um, I never really thought about it in that And then way. also um, there is a phenomenon of, you know, uh, what's called elicited aggression or, or even really evoked aggression. Like you can have, um, like if you get hurt, something hurts mm-hmm. you, you may lash out. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So those, those are sort of two ways that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. people respond to avert, you know, learners, people, dogs, you know, animals respond to aversive stimulation. And one is to try to get away from it, turn it off. And the other is to go toward it and, you know, give it be a aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and that aggression can be directed towards, um, other things that happen to be nearby. So like in some of those, this horrible old experiments, like, you know, they would shock a pigeon and the pigeon would turn on another pigeon that was next to it. Mm. You know, so those are some of the risks of yeah. using something like uh, like a, a, a shock collar or a citronella spray collar for barking. 
there's other, I think the citronella spray, there's also some other risks. Like if you have more than one dog, you're going to end up spraying. Yeah. You know, it's un- unpleasant for the other dog too. Um, or another dog barks and your, and your dog gets sprayed. Um, yeah. That can create some weird associations and avoidance behaviors too. Um, then there's also just, um, you know, most, most professions for humans where you're going to change someone's behavior they have ethical they have ethical standards that require them to use uh, less aversive, less intrusive procedures first, which usually means using reinforcement based right. things first. I don't know if it's a direct parallel with dog owners because dog owners are more like parents and yeah. there's laws about what you can do to children too, but like not enough probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, but uh, it, it, it's not a direct parallel, but you know, as, as professionals, we, you know, the trainers that I run with and that you run with have, uh, have ethical standards that, um, that require for each individual, you're going to start with less intrusive, effective procedures it's tough though because i mean i have had some clients where you know they're going to get kicked out of their housing and i do think and so i i have never recommended a bark collar but i have had a i had one case where i didn't get on the person about it you know Mm -hmm. i I looked at the dog and the dog seemed to not be suffering ill effects Um, and so I didn't, I wasn't like marching in there saying, you got to stop doing this, you know, horrible thing to your dog. And, you know, and can I, can I try to give her some skills that will make it unnecessary to use the collar in the future? You know, I hope so, but, um, you know, have empathy for people, uh, who are in dire situations where they're having a hard time living with their, what their dog does. You know, I told, I told her what the risks were. I told her what I would be looking for, right. you know, in, to be worried about and things like that. And I worked with her on trying to get right. some other skills for the dog so that she didn't need it anymore. But yeah. I mean, that's kind of how I approach other like things like prong collars too. I honestly don't get very many people who are using a shot collar when they get to me. So either I just think it's not as common in the city. Really? Like people aren't, don't have, like, I never get clients that have invisible fences. And I've had, I've had, I've had some clients where a trainer tried a shock collar before, but, but they're, they're coming to me because it didn't work. So it's not usually, but right. the prong collar is a little more, right. you know, I, I have, that's more, a more common thing. And again, like, I, I'm not going to ask somebody to stop doing what makes them feel safe until we right. give them some skills. Uh, to feel safe without it. Right. So, Do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah. It's just really, there's a problem solving model that applies to all behavior and it's helpful to apply it to barking. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Baru podcast. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to rate and follow the Baru podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And you can follow us on Instagram at Baru Pet. And if you have a behavior question, a health question, or a story of canine companionship you want to share with me, you can email me, charlotte at the baru.com, or you can call the new call in number 424 273 5131 and leave a message. And if you don't have a pen handy, not to worry, you can find all the contact info in the show notes. Okay, you guys, let's chat next week.